Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, Rod Cam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Fostering Network Scotland survey that found children to be moving too many times while in care. Minister Fiona MacLeod. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government recognises the need for all children and young people, including those in care, to live in a safe, secure, permanent, nurturing home. Regrettably, we know that too many children and young people in care are experiencing drift and delay, leading to multiple placements. The Scottish Government is working with CELSIS, the Centre for Looked After Children, to deliver our Permanence and Care Excellence PACE programme, which brings together partners, including local authorities, children's hearings, health, education and the courts, to look at how they can improve systems and practice to deliver permanence more quickly for looked after children and young people. Roderick Campbell. I thank the Minister for that answer. She will be aware that in the Foster Network Scotland survey recently published, approximately 8% of the children surveyed were with their 10th family since going into care. What support is available to foster carers to help ensure children in care receive the stability they require? Minister. I would like to say to Mr Campbell that the Scottish Government is, sub is committed to supporting foster carers and in response to a recommendation of the National Review of Foster Care, we are producing a learning and development framework that will provide foster carers with a mechanism to ensure that they are fully equipped for the role. We are also providing funding of £280,363 in each year 2014 to 2016 through the Third Sector Early Intervention Fund to support the work of the Fostering Network who provide the Foster Line Support Helpline and a range of other support services to all foster carers. Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will recall my member's debate on Midlothian kinship carers. And while applauding the commitment of foster carers, given that kinship care often provides the stability which fostering may not, what measures is the Scottish Government taking to provide support to the many and increasing number of kinship carers? Minister. In that debate, Ms Graham will, re will recall that I talked about the Scottish Government and our commitment to support kinship carers. And that is why we have legislated through the Looked After Children Regulations of 2009 and the Children and Young People Act of 2014 to recognise and support kinship carers of both looked after and non-looked after children. And in legislation, this is for the first time. We also recognise that more can be done to support kinship carers and those in care and that there is a need for greater fairness in the provision of allowances. So we are currently reviewing the financial support available to kinship carers with a view to tailoring support and tackling inconsistencies across Scotland. Question two, Mardo Fraser. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve care services for adults with cerebral palsy. Minister, Jimmy Hepburn. Access to care services for adults with cerebral palsy is based on a, an individual assessment of need. Care services fall within core local authority social, service, social work service functions, generally supported by the Scottish Government. Physiotherapy services can also offer assessment and advice, which may be followed by treatment and or uh, equipment uh, provision. It is for NHS boards to determine the level of service they provide based on local priorities and need. Personalised and integrated service for adults with cerebral palsy will be strengthened further with implementation of the Social Care Self Directed Support Scotland Act 2013 and the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014. Martin Fraser. Um, can, can I thank the Minister for his uh, response? It is the experience of some of my constituents who are young adults with cerebral palsy that while the services for uh, those under 18 uh, can be very good, when they uh, reach the age of majority, the services for adults are patchy uh, at best. Does the Minister not think that there is need for a more joined up approach? for those for 18 and above who made that transition are simply finding that the services they enjoyed while they were uh, uh, children are not there when they are adults. Minister. Well, I thank uh, Murdo Fraser for his question. He will be aware of uh, Bobath Scotland. Uh, I'm sure he will be aware of the Chief Executive of Bobath uh, Scotland, Stephanie Fraser, who has raised some of these issues with me before, so I'm aware uh, that it is an issue of being able to correspond with her directly. I would uh, go back to the initial answer, of course, it is for each NHS board to deliver services locally. Cerebral palsy also presents very differently in each individual and can allow for other conditions to manifest. It is important that 
each person's clinical pathway should uh, take a person-centred approach in relation to their individual needs, and I recognise that is as important in uh, adult age as it is in childhood. And if uh, Mr Fraser wants to correspond with me directly on this matter and raise any specific concerns, I would be very happy to get back to him. Question three, James Dornan. Thank you, uh, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the number of people who are homeless in Glasgow. Minister, Margaret Burgess. Okay. During 2013-14, there were 4,974 homeless or threatened with homelessness assessments in Glasgow. This was a 16% reduction on the 5,921 homeless or threatened with homelessness assessments during 2012-13. The next homelessness statistics covering 2014-15 will be published at 9.30 a.m. on the 30th of June 2015. These can be accessed on the Scottish Government website. James Dornan. I thank the Minister for that answer. And, uh, much as I am delighted to hear about the, the drop in the, the homeless figures, they clearly are far too high. Uh, uh, the Minister will be aware of the ongoing dispute between the homeless case workers and Glasgow City Council, which has led to these important members of staff being in strike for the past 12 weeks. There have also been claims by a Glasgow City Labour Councillor that the fault for non-referrals to housing associations lay with the housing associations, a claim quite vigorously denied and condemned by the housing associations. Does the Minister agree with me that it is time for Glasgow City Council to be less intransigent with the striking homeless workers, less strident in their tone with housing associations, and work together to put in place a plan to ensure that vulnerable homeless people across Glasgow are getting the help and support they need and desire? Minister. Uh, as I indicated uh, last week in response to a question, the dispute in Glasgow is a matter for the Council and its employees, but I very much hope that it is a dispute that can be brought to a satisfactory conclusion very soon. Ensuring homeless people receive the service they need is vital and it is a statutory duty of the Council. I do think that housing associations and the, the, the Council should work together to look at the housing options approached and to ensure that we can, they can work together to, to provide the best services for homeless people in Glasgow. Question four, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact will be on jobs, investment and services of the additional £107 million reduction in the Scottish budget recently announced by the Chancellor. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government believes that the Chancellor's decision to reduce the budget already agreed by this Parliament is utterly unacceptable and falls a long way short of the Prime Minister's promise to govern with respect. I took the opportunity when I met the Chancellor on the 8th of June to set out an alternative to the UK Government's austerity programme that would allow us to continue to invest in our public services whilst ensuring the sustainability of the public finances. We will see if the Chancellor has heeded my advice in his 8th of July emergency budget, and we will reflect on the £107 million reduction in the light of that announcement. In the meantime, I can assure the Member that I will continue to strive to minimise the impact of the UK Government's austerity agenda on jobs, investment and services in Scotland. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Does she agree that as long as this Parliament remains at the mercy of budgetary decisions taken elsewhere, jobs, services and the communities that rely on them will be at the whim of a Chancellor Scotland did not elect. And the sooner Scotland has a full range of powers to make its own decisions, both to raise and spend their resources, the sooner Scotland can become a fairer and more prosperous country. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I agree with Mr Gibson's point, and I would set out to him that uh, clearly the ability of the Scottish Government to intervene to address some of the uh, challenging issues that we face as a country um, is limited by the powers that we have. We use them to the full uh, and in every respect, um, but there will be other measures that we would want to take which we cannot take because of the, uh, the limitations of devolution. But there is also the added factor, which Mr Gibson highlights in his question, which is of in your budget reductions, which are applied by the Chancellor, um, when we have already set our budget. And that raises implications for the Scottish Government that we have to deal with. And these are unwelcome implications for the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. Malcolm Chisholm. I congratulate the Deputy First Minister for taking a robust line with the Chancellor in opposing these uh, counterproductive cuts and also trying to persuade him that they are not required by the Charter for Budget Responsibility. When, at what point did he realise that uh, all that he said uh, during the election campaign about the Charter for Budget Responsibility requiring £30 billion worth of cuts, at what point did he realise that that was a load of rubbish? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, the, the, the issue for Malcolm Chisholm is the fact that his colleagues in the House of Commons trooped into the lobbies with the Conservatives to vote for the Charter of Budget Responsibility, which involved the reduction in public spending by £30 billion over a two-year period. And that was what the Labour Party supported. Now, the issue with the Chancellor is that the Chancellor is going even further in trying to reduce public expenditure beyond the Charter for Budget Responsibility, and that is the issue that I have raised in my submission. And I would have thought that the Labour Party, having uh, pursued such uh, a, 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 an ineffective strategy in the United Kingdom general election, would be trying to do what Mr Chisholm started off trying to do in the question, but regrettably deviated from his original thrust, and that was uh, to stand shoulder to shoulder with this government in resisting austerity. Alex Johnson. Uh, can the Deputy First Minister give me a, a guarantee that when he announces the figures uh, later this week, I believe, or next week, that uh, the underspend for last year will be a figure less than £107 million? Otherwise, many of his remarks today are going to look a bit silly. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, 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 Mr. Mr Johnson will not have to wait until next week, because I would have, so I would have thought that such an informed commentator as Mr Johnson would have known that the statement about the provisional outturn is in fact this afternoon. So if Mr Johnson has woken up sufficiently for the parliamentary business, he will be able to interrogate me on that question in just a few hours' time. Question number five, in the name of Ian Gray, has been withdrawn for understandable reasons because he's got his questions a wee bit later on. Question number six, Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Commission on Local Tax Reform last met and what matters were discussed. Minister Marco Biaggi. The Commission on Local Tax Reform is an independent commission which I jointly convene as the Scottish Government nominee alongside David O'Neill, the President of COSLA. The Commission last met on 9 June, its seventh full meeting, when we heard the preliminary findings of commissioned research on international examples of local tax reforms. The Commission also held a public roundtable on 15 June with representatives of SIPFA, IRRV, SOLAS, the SAA and the Improvement Service to take oral evidence. This is the fifth of ten such evidence sessions. The Commission remains on schedule to report in the autumn. Jimmy Dave. I thank the Minister for that answer. Given that the research by Professor David Bell and David Iser of Stirling University reported in today's Herald shows that the income gap between rich and poor has widened since 1997, to what extent has the Commission not only considered international evidence on local taxation but wealth distribution? And will the Minister give an assurance that in bringing forward proposals to replace the Council tax, the principles of fairness, progressive taxation and ability to pay will be at the heart of these proposals. Minister. The remit of the Commission states that we are to identify and examine alternatives that would deliver a fairer system of local taxation. The first consideration listed is impacts on inequalities in income and wealth. I would encourage any member to promote the five-minute survey at localtaxcommission.scot to get a better understanding of public priorities around that. No technical knowledge is required, and I would welcome the member's uh, contribution to that, along with all others, too. Question 7, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how much land and forest has been bought and sold by Forestry Commission Scotland since 2010, and at what cost? Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. First Commission Scotland buys and sells land as part of its repositioning programme. This involves selling parts of the national forest estate, which deliver few public benefits, and investing the proceeds in, land, in new land and forests that deliver more for the people of Scotland. Since 2010, Forest Commission Scotland has bought 11,514 hectares at a cost of £39 million. £646,541 and it sold 25,109 hectares totalling £58,150,784. The balance of the money is used to invest in the properties that have been bought, for example, in establishing starter farms or planting new woodlands. Further details of all the land bought and sold by Forest Commission Scotland since 1999 is available on the Forest Commission Scotland website. Rob Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, I have constituents who are concerned about uh, transfers of land and sales of land, and uh, I want to know, if possible, at what size of acreage of land 
Can the Forestry Commission sell that plot without consulting the local community? Minister. Um, there is no specific limit to the area of land or woodland that First Commission Scotland can sell without community involvement and consultation. However, I can assure Mr Gibson that the majority of sales carried out by the First Commission Scotland are part of their repositioning programme, whereby they are first offered to communities um, or environmental NGOs to acquire or lease under the terms of the National Forest Land Scheme. There are occasions where First Commission Scotland will consider direct requests from neighbours and other private interests to acquire part of the National Forest Estate. This is usually in situations where the land in question is not contentious and could, for example, include sales of houses or other development sites uh, to the sitting tenants, exchange of forest or open land to rationalise boundaries of land holdings, um, or sales of small areas of land to the adjoining owners. In the above cases, First Commission Scotland does not notify communities um, or environmental NGOs unless there is a known community interest. Question 8, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it will take to prevent taxi drivers with a series of complaints against them in one local authority area from obtaining a taxi driver's licence in another area. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, licence authorities are obliged by the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982 to refuse an application where, in their view, the applicant is not a fit and proper person to be the holder of the licence. The legislation also requires them to make such reasonable inquiries as they see fit when considering an application. We would therefore expect licensing authorities to exercise their discretion in fulfilling this obligation and make inquiries with adjacent authorities where appropriate. In addition, Police Scotland are a statutory consultee and they are able to provide relevant information from across Scotland and beyond the licensing authority. We shall further encourage such sharing of information when the best practice guidance is updated after the passage of the Air Weapons and Licensing Bill. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? As he will know, there have been cases reported in the media where this has happened. And I would ask the Scottish Government what further measures it might be able to take through legislation or guidance for the local authorities to tighten this up and make the experience of travelling in a taxi as safe as possible, particularly for young women. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I agree with the member on the need to make sure that we have got proper and effective enforcement in this area. That is one of the reasons why, within the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill, which is currently before uh, Parliament, we have created the role of the Civic Licensing Standard Officer, who will have a specific responsibility to look at areas around guidance at a localised level, uh, supervising uh, compliance with that, and also mediation. I hope that that will also add to the way in which we can apply the national best practice guidance that is issued alongside this legislation to ensure that that has been properly and effectively implemented at a localised level. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. On the subject of protecting consumers' interests in the taxi market, does the Scottish Government consider that this should remain the principal aim in any provisions or regulations relating to licensing? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, licensing at a localised level is taken forward by licensing boards within local authorities, and there are no plans to change that. Question 9, Linda Fabiani. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government what initiatives it is introduced to increase the supply of social housing. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government has set a five-year target to deliver 30,000 affordable homes, 20,000 of which are for social rent, and 5,000 of those being through our Council House New Build programme. We are well on track to meet the target, as recent official statistics have demonstrated. We are achieving this through a range of initiatives using both traditional grant funding, but also working creatively with partners on innovative financing routes. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Minister. I noticed recently that Falkirk Council are putting funds from their pension scheme by investing £30 million in social and affordable housing. Uh, it seems that that kind of sound investment with a good return, enabling you to build affordable homes in your area, is an excellent use of resources. I, I gather that local government pension schemes across Scotland hold investments worth more than £30 billion in a range of assets. Does the Minister believe that councils such as South Lanarkshire could be using their pension funds to help build affordable housing and social homes within their council area. 
Briefly, Minister. Uh, well, pension fund managers have to make sound investment decisions to ensure suitable returns. However, this government is working to enable and support pension funds to invest in housing, and the recent uh, Falkirk scheme is a trailblazer that shows investment <coughs> is possible, and I would encourage all pension funds to consider the opportunities that exist for investment in housing. Thank you, Minister. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one. 